أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله وعلى أهل بيتك المذلومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا غريب يا مظلوم كربلا ما خاب من تمسك بكم ولا منا من لجأ إليكم سادتي يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوزا والله فوزا عظيما قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم والقول كالحق والاستق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا المودة في القربة صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات الله عليه وسلم In all cultures and traditions across the world, no matter what country you come from or what language you speak, there is a common denominator of giving thanks. Everybody in life, no matter the culture once again, has their own way and their own method of giving thanks to someone else. It is a universal concept that all people, regardless of religious boundaries, accept. In the religion of Islam, we are told to be thankful for several things. Which is why we are always taught from amongst the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt, والسلام, that for every benefit that we receive, we should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying Alhamdulillah. A man once came to Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam And the Imam told him, I'm going to thank God in a way that no one ever thanked him before. So he said, go ahead, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, O grandson of the Prophet. He said, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So he said, what so? Amazing about that. He said, compare our Alhamdulillah with yours. If for example, any of us, we are going and we are walking in the street, we see a flower and it's very beautiful looking. We see it, we smell it, it smells nice. We say Alhamdulillah, praise be to God. This is a very beautiful thing. But if someone else was coming down the street, that person happened to be an expert on plants, a scientist, a biologist or whatever, Whoever is called an expert in plants, he walks by, he sees the beautiful tree, his alhamdulillah is going to be a little bit different. He's not going to say alhamdulillah for its smell or for its fragrance or for its beautiful look. He's going to say for the, you know, chemistry or biological processes that took place in regard to this plant. Right? But when, when the imam thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is thanking him, recognizing his status in relation to God, and so on and so forth. So when we go and we try to see what should we be truly thankful for, in Mafatih al-Jinan, there's a very popular dua, which we are always told to recite in order to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first thing that our Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa First thing that he teaches us to be thankful for is this. He said, Alhamdulillah al-Ladhi arrafani nafsahu wa lam yatrukni amyan al-qalb. All praise is due to Allah. Thanks be to Allah who guided our hearts toward Him and not made us astray. Today, we are here in the majlis of Abi Abdullah al-Hussein alayhi salatu wassalam. 
Imam al Hussein, we said, is the ark, the ship that takes us to paradise, the ship of salvation. Only a few people are here in the Majlis, when the rest of the world are doing many other things. They're involved in things that do not involve coming to the Majlis of Aba Abdullah. Which is why, again, in this dua, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, alladhi, oh Allah, praises be to you, thanks be to you, that you made our hearts come toward you and not toward a football game or not toward anything else in your life. We came for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In, in honor of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu was salam. The second thing that we should be thankful for according to the hadith, it says, Alhamdulillah, alladhi, Ja'alani min ummati Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad wa Muhammad Praises or thanks be to Allah for making us from the people of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. For what better gift do we have than being amongst the ummah of our Prophet? There is no better gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. He has allowed us to be amongst those who are the followers of a rahmatul alameen, the mercy unto the world, the individual who is the foremost role model for all of humanity. We are from the, from the people, from the community, from the supporters of our holy prophet. The third thing that we are told to be thankful for the dua we are told to recite Alhamdulillah alladhi ja'ala rizq fi yadayhi wa lam yaj'ala rizq fi aydin nas Thanks, O oh Allah, praises be to you, O oh Lord who made our rizq, our wealth, our sustenance in your hands and not in the hands of the people <coughs> because if our wealth, if our life, if our sustenance was put into the hands of our bosses and of our enemies and of people in general, surely we'd all be living on the street, we'd all be struggling. And if we go ahead and we see the short story, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu was salam. He is walking to the masjid to pray salat. As he is going toward the masjid, he finally reaches there, he gets off, he finds a poor man on the street. He tells this man, can you watch my horse for me while I go and I pray salat? It's only going to be a few minutes. Imam Ali salam goes into the masjid, he prays the salat, prays the namaz, he comes out, and he sees that his horse is there, but the saddle, not there anymore. He's saying, what happened? He asks a few people. And he finds out, or he assumes, that the saddle must have been stolen by that man. He says, no problem. Imam Ali gets on his horse, he continues on his journey. He goes to a store that used to sell saddles. Obviously, you cannot find that in Denver, probably, right? But for example, maybe the equivalent of, you know, Hertz Rent-A-Car, I don't know what. Okay? So Imam Ali, alayhi salam, goes to the store, and what does he see? He sees that same saddle of his. So he asks the shopkeeper, give me this. He purchases it. He puts it on his horse. And as he's about to go, he asks the shopkeeper. He says, oh man, he says, now that I've already paid for the saddle, he said, when did you get it? He said, a man 15 minutes ago, he came and he sold it to me. So Mali smiled. And he said, how much did you buy it, buy it for? Since I already paid for it now. He said, I paid for it, you know, two dirham." Imam Ali got on his horse and he begins to laugh a little bit. So the shopkeeper says, why do you laugh? I don't, I don't know the funny story behind this. So Imam Ali salam said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who ordains our rizq. I had the intention of going into the masjid. When I came out of prayers, I was going to give that man who stole my saddle to dirham. But instead he went, he stole it, made his money from haram means, Okay? And he got the money that way. But it's already been written for us, which is why also in the hadith in Nahj al Balagha, Imam Amir al Mu'mineen says, I am amazed at two types of people. Which two types of people? The first one is the one who runs away from his death. 
and the second one is the one who runs toward his rizq. Because both of those things he cannot avoid. And both of those things are not going to come any quicker or get postponed anymore. We have to make the effort, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained that for us. So the first thing we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for is thanks for our hearts being in, in, in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second thing that we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for is to be from the people, from the community of our Holy Prophet. The third thing is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordaining our rizq and not the people. What is the fourth thing? The fourth thing, Alhamdulillah alladhi arafani nafsahu wa lam yaturkni amiyana qabla. Alhamdulillah alladhi ja'alani min ummati Muhammad. Alhamdulillah alladhi ja'ala rizqi fi yaday wa lam yaj'ala rizq fi aid al-nas. Alhamdulillah alladhi sattaru dhunubi wa uyubi wa lam yafdahni bayna khala'iq. All thanks and all praises be to God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For what? For you, O oh Allah, are the one who covers our sins. You are the one who knows our sins and doesn't disclose it to the people. Because if the people knew what type of people we are, we would have no status. We would not be respected. Nobody would like us if they know what we do to our parents, how we talk back to them or what we do in the workplace, or what we do in the privacy of our own homes. If the people know, nobody would have any respect. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is, is that Lord, that merciful God of ours, who controls it and only keeps it between us and Him. But we go ahead and we see that there are many other things that we should be thankful for in our life that are not only exclusive to these four things. And if we go ahead and if we really ponder, we see one thing that is completely missing from this, but perhaps in it is a manifestation within this du'a. And that we can always include in the recitation of this du'a, which again is found towards the end of Mafatih al jinnah And this last thing that we should always add and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, is by saying these few words, Alhamdulillah alladhi ja'alani min al sakina بولايه امير المؤمنين والائمه عليهم السلام صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد واجل فرجه praises or thanks be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making us one of those who have the wilaya of amir al-mu'minin alayhi salatu wassalam for once we have the wilaya of amir al-mu'minin it's comprehensive of all of these issues for we worried about our sins, what we say in Ziyarat al Jamia to Ahl al Bayt, you are kafaratum bi dhunubina. You are the ones who cover our sins. O oh, Amir al Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib is the one who will give us the shafa'a in all of our aspects of our life. Thus, we should always thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for being of those who understand and who recognize the wadaya of Him and of all of the Imams of the Ahl al Bayt. Which is why today if we go ahead and we take a look at the world, we take a look at the grand scheme of things, we see that people, no matter who they are, they're always looking or desiring for some higher cause in their life. You go ahead and you see that all across the world today, there is a new religion that has come out called Scientology, for example. This religion, started by some celebrities and whatnot, they say we are looking for something higher. We have wealth. We have money, we have all of this luxuries in our life, but we're not very happy. You go ahead and you see athletes and all prominent people who do not have religion, they have a problem in their life. They're in the search of role models. They're in the search of individuals who they can look up to. What, what do we have? We have the best examples, the most pure examples in the essence and in the manifestation of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salatu wassalam. Before we go ahead, we take a look at Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wassalam. Amir al-Mu'mineen in the battlefield manifests the wrath of God. He punishes those who oppose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the same time, he manifests the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when dealing with the orphans. We see these contradictions in creation in terms of the Ahlul Bayt 
alayhimu salatu was salam. And people might wonder, young people, they might ask, why is it that we have to love the Ahlul Bayt alayhimu salatu was salam so much? Why do we always have to talk about them? We go ahead and we see that even their enemies, even their enemies used to love them. After they died, they missed them. And it's said when the news came of the death of Amir al-Mu'mineen, the martyrdom of Amir al-Mu'mineen to Muawiyah, he received the word, and it is said that he had his food in front of him, and he began to cry and cry and cry so much until his food began filled with his own tears. His slave came to him, his servant came to him and said, Muawiyah, you are the biggest opponent of Amir al-Mu'mineen, of Ali. Why today you cry for Ali? He said that man's character was too good. He was too much of a perfect person. We go ahead and we see Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu was salam is fighting in the battle of Sifin. He is fighting somebody and that man he loses his sword. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen is going toward that man. That man has fallen on the floor and he's beginning to say his last will. He's beginning, beginning to know that now he's going to die. No one ever beats Amir al-Mu'mineen in the war. Never. He, Imam Ali alayhi salam puts his sword down. He goes towards him and he says, My brother, he said, are you okay? Is everything okay with you? He says, yes, aren't you going to kill me? He said, no, I'm worried about you. You have no sword. You cannot defend yourself. He said, well, in that case, I'm bleeding. Immediately, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he calls his companions to pick this man up, to take him to the tent to bandage him, to give him food, to give him water, to take care of him. Amir al-Mu'mineen goes to visit that man a little while later, and he says, oh Ali, he says, I want to be one of your followers. He says, why? He says, because of your character. Imam Ali says, don't follow because of me, but follow because of the truth. That's why you should follow. But you see the examples of Ahl al-Bayt alayhim salatu was salam, they take people to the right. <coughs> Which is why today, when we're coming to examine what is the situation across the world, especially today, as the political situation for us, the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa are becoming Allah, Muslim. Allah, Muslim. Allah, Muhammad, Muhammad, are becoming very tense with the situation of Islamophobia, all of this type of talk. We go ahead and we go straight back to seeing the etiquette, the ethics of Ahlul Bayt We talk about animal rights in this country. On the day of Ashura, Abi Abdullah al Hussein he pierces through the army of Amr ibn Saad. He reaches the Euphrates. He's been thirsty for days. What does he say? He says, oh my horse, take water. Who are these individuals? If they are not people, who are of the most moral stature that you cannot find in the entire world, and I don't know who they are. But some people, they still might say that, you know, our followers, our, our um, successors to the Prophet are better than yours. These were appointed by the Prophet, so on and so forth. Or the Prophet doesn't appoint. All we have to do to respond to them is by saying one thing. You bring me one person better after the Prophet then Ali ibn Abi Talib, and you bring me one woman better than Fatima al Zahra, I will follow them. We will follow them. No problem. You say, this guy and this guy and this guy is better than Ali? Come on. Who are we kidding ourselves? You bring someone who's better in terms of ethics and in terms of morals than Ali ibn Abi Talib, we will follow them. No doubt about it. A woman better than Fatima, we'll follow her. But by God, no one is ever going to find people of better moral stature than these individuals. Which is why today, it's extremely unfortunate that you go ahead and you see the textbooks written by Orientalist and Western scholars, and some young people when they go ahead and they study in college, religious studies or Islamic studies, they write about the greatness of the Umayyads, the greatness of the Abbasids, and they speak about their legacy and textbooks are written. All we have to do is go ahead and analyze the character of these people. That no matter who they were, there was always a group of them who fell in love with the Ahlul Bayt. 
who always oppose their own fathers, who always oppose their own teachings. We see Yazid, Yazid ibn Muawiyah, the killer of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. His son, Muawiyah II, he rises on the pulpit after his father is killed. He says, my father and my grandfather are cursed people. I am ashamed of my own lineage. Forty days later, he is poisoned by Marwan bin Hakim. And we go ahead and we see the Umayyads. One of them, I believe, Abdul Malik bin Marwan, if I'm not mistaken, he built a house on top of the Kaaba. Why? Because he didn't like people doing the tawaf and sending their praises on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he built a little home on top of the Kaaba. And he was hoping that the people would make it tawaf and recognize that, oh, he's the caliph of the ummah. This is the type of people they were. We go ahead, we see Muawiyah. Muawiyah was such a filthy man, was such an abnormal human being. One historian, he says that Muawiyah, one day he is in Damascus, his capital is in Damascus. He orders ice, a block of ice, to come from Egypt. Egypt is in North Africa. Damascus is extremely far. When it reaches him, a block of ice obviously going to melt, it's going to go through past the desert. It comes in one cube, he could put it in his wine, and he drinks that, and he is satisfied by this type of life. And just on a side note, very quickly, I was in a discussion with a individual who is from the school of Bani Umayyah. <laughs> Let's be nice. Okay. And during the month of Ramadan, and we got into a discussion about Muawiyah. So I told him, what do you say about the hadith that says from Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Let the stomach of Muawiyah never be, you know, satiated. Let it never be full. He said, oh, this is the barakah of Muawiyah. This is a blessing on Muawiyah. Why? Because the food in this world is a blessing. Right? I said, yes, it's a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, well, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala never wanted Muawiyah to be full. He wanted to keep on taking in the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. We see Yazid. Yazid ibn Muawiyah, what type of a man he was. Yazid is a man who used to, of course, love to bet, love to gamble. And he would always bet on his pet monkey, Abu Al-Qais, to run in the track of horses. He would put his monkey on top of the horse, send them out to run, okay? One day in this, in this, in this race, his monkey fell off the horse, died. Yazid now is the, is the caliph, okay, is the political ruler of like 50 current, 50 current day countries. He is a leader of the Middle East into Spain, across northern Africa, so much part of the world. And Yazid, what does he do? He calls for a funeral inv inviting all of the ministers of 50 current day countries to visit and take part in this funeral procession of his pet monkey, Abu Al-Qais. And he's a politician. He's ruler of maybe a third or a, or a fourth of the world. And on the flip side, we see the etiquette of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Allah 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 We see the etiquette of Abi Abdullah, Amir al muminin the Caliph of the Muslim Ummah. He is one day walking in the street. He sees a woman holding two large bags and saying, May God curse Ali ibn Abi Talib. He sent my husband to be killed in the battle while he sits on his throne in Kufa, on his golden throne, living this luxurious life. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, with his face covered, he goes to this woman and says, Oh, my lady, is there anything I can do for you? She says, No, thank you. She, he says, let, I insist, let me take care of you, he says, fine. While I go and I make the bread in my house, you t watch after my kids. I mean, he says, my pleasure. The first day he goes, he watches after the kids. 
while the woman is cooking, she keeps on cursing Ari ibn Abi Talib. Imam Ali al Mu'mini keeps quiet, doesn't say anything. This, this woman obviously does not recognize that this is Imam Ali alayhi salam. Imam Ali comes out, next day he comes back, third day, fourth day he comes back, and he, and he entertains the kids so much. Look at the character of Amir al Mu'mineen. It is said that one of the boys in this house, he went to Amir al Mu'mineen. He, he went to Ali. He said, Oh man, he said, My father, he used to always allow us to ride on his horse. But now he's passed away, we don't know where his horse is. Mama Ali gets on his horse, he gets on his knees, he gets on his hands, and he says, I will be your horse. And then they say, oh man, you know, we used to hold the reins of our father's horse. He says, hold on to my hair, and I will, and, 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 and pretend that this is the reins of your horse. Mama Amir al-Mu'mineen, he is, he is playing around with the kids. The kids say, oh, oh, oh man, when we used to pull the reins of our horse, of, of our father's horse, he used to make nays, he used to make sounds. They used to pull the hair of Ali, and he would make sounds to entertain the children. This is the etiquette of Amir al-Mu'mineen. One day he is leaving the home, another woman is walking by, and recognizes that this is Ali ibn Abi Talib. She knocks the door of that woman, she enters into the house, and she says, O oh woman, do you know that Ali ibn Abi Talib was in your house? What was he doing there? He said, who? Ali was in our house. She runs toward him and she says, Oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, forgive me. Every moment, every breath was coming out of my mouth, was cursing you. Yet today, you were serving me. She gets down on her, on her knees and she begins to kiss the feet of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Mom Ali says, No, forgive me. Forgive me because it is my responsibility as your imam to do this. How could anyone not fall in love with Ali ibn Abi Dar. Not fall in love with Ahl al Bayt alayhim salatu wa salam. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajil falajahum. Thus, I want to briefly talk about, touch on a few aspects today. In terms of the notion of brotherhood in Islam that Ahl al Bayt alayhim salatu wa salam came with in order to teach us how to act as humanitarians in society. For regardless of the oppression that we face on a daily basis amongst the followers of the Ahl al-Bayt, the Zawar of Abi Abdullah al Hussein today who died in Karbala, the Shia of Ahl al-Bayt have always been those who responded with words that are better. They have always done things in a way that brings people closer toward Ahl al-Bayt And it is of the most utmost importance that in our lives we go ahead and we learn the respect that Ahl al-Bayt has taught us. And in terms of the notion of brotherhood and the rights of brothers in the religion of Islam, Imam Zain al-Abideen in his Rasanat al-Huquq, and amongst the traditions of Ahl al-Bayt, teach us or have told us that there are three types of brothers in the religion of Islam. The first type, of course, is your blood brother. The one who is your brother by birth. You have the same parents as that brother. The second type of brother that we are taught are your brothers, of course, in faith, as per the famous tradition of Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Malik al-Ashtar, in letter 53 of Nahj al balagh and of course, the third one, which Amir al muminin also mentions, is of your brothers in humanity. The first thing we need to do is recognize that we may have brothers in our society who were born into the same family, brothers or sisters, of course. We were born in the same family. We have the same parents. We must develop a relationship where at least one of us make an effort to bring the other one closer to Islam. Not all the time fighting, not all the time arguing. And we go ahead and we see Qur'anic examples of this. For example, we see the story of Habil and Qabil. What happened? Of course, they both made the sacrifice. Qabil wants to kill Habil. He takes the rock and is about to strike him on the head. And what does Habil respond? He says, oh my brother, I recognize the rights of the brother. And if you raise your arm against me, I will not hit you back. This is what the brother this is how the relationship of brothers have to work in our religion. But we go ahead and we see that also we should notice 
And we should see examples across the Qur'an and see how many times brothers, they had to forgive. They had many difficulties in their life. We see Yusuf salam and his brothers. We see Prophet Yusuf, of course we know he is thrown into the well after they reunite. Before the brothers are able to ask Yusuf salam for forgiveness, he says, and I forgive you today. Don't worry about it. Everything you've done to me, you threw me in a well, I went to a prison, I was, I was put in the most difficult situations. But I forgive you. Don't worry about it. Because at the end of the day, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can choose not to forgive us if we do not forgive our own brothers and sisters. Then we go ahead and we see the second type of brotherhood that is spoken about in, by, by the traditions of Ahlul Bayt. And these are brothers in faith, brothers in the religion. We all come, we all lovers of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi wa salam wa alayhi. This should be Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa alayhi. This is sufficient for us to not create divisions. We love Amir al-Mu'mineen, at the very least we can ask about each other. Because when we bring different differences in our community, we see that this is the problem. We are the lovers of Amin al-Manin Ali ibn Abi Talib. We come for the mentions of Imam al-Hussein. Yet there are two people who argued about, you know, who is going to, you know, eat the last bit of the food, you know, today in this majlis or something like that. I don't know what. And you see so many problems amongst people who are amongst the followers of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wasalam. At least one of us has to make the effort. And the third thing that which we want to talk about a little bit briefly for a few minutes today is about brothers in humanity. For we are to go ahead and we see that all the time Ahlul Bayt والسلام, would treat, as we said, even their enemies with the greatest bit of akhlaq. One day, Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam is walking down the street with his companions. He is walking, 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 when all of a sudden in the distance they see a man, he is close by, walking very, very slowly. The Prophet tells everyone, stop here. Stop here. They say, Rasulullah, why are we stopping? He said, just listen to me. They go, after a few minutes, then they go again to Rasulullah. They said, Ya Rasulullah, why did you ask us to stop? And they said, do you know that man all the way very far? He's a very old man. He's an extremely old man. He is walking very slowly. If we overtake him when we're walking, he might wonder and he might think that, you know, I wish I was young again. I'm an old man. I don't have the strength of these young people anymore. And we should not do that to that man. We should not be the cause of him thinking that. They told him, Ya Rasulullah, O oh Prophet, but that man is a Jewish man. Prophet Muhammad got extremely angry and said, O oh people, that this is a human being. Even if it be to cross him when he's walking, because he might feel bad that I'm older, I'm an elderly man, and I, cannot, and I cannot walk at the same speed as the young people, then don't do that. That is the etiquette, that is the akhlaq of the Ahlul Bayt. In the battle of Safin, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, he pierces through the battle. He comes back to Qambar, his servant. Qambar gives him a drink of water. He's about to take the water and he says, Oh Qambar, did you give it to all of our companions first? He said, yes. I gave it to everybody. He says, did you give it to this group of people over there? He said, yes. How about these people over here? Yes. Did you give it to those people on the other side of the water over there? Qambar said, no, I did not give it to them. Amir al-Mu'mineen gets down from the horse and says, Oh Qambar. What type of person are you that you did not give the water to them and then you gave it to me? Qabr says, oh, I mean, those are the people who are trying to shed your blood. Those are the people of Muawiyah. He says, but they're human beings. But they're human beings. <coughs> Yet today we go ahead and we completely throw out this concept from our religion. But we go ahead and we always see that Ahlul Bayt alayhi wassalam, through their leadership skills and through their etiquette, they were always able to bring people closer toward the religion of Islam. Which is why when we go to come to understand one of the greatest effects, one of the greatest 
reasons for the success of the revolution of Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salatu was salam. Allahumma salam. Allahumma salam. Allahumma We see that the primary cause was through his akhlaq. Every step of the way that he took, he remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every step that he took, he brought people, people closer to his belief system, brought people closer toward Ahlul Bayt We see, during the time of Muawiyah, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is in Medina still at this time. There is a man who is sent by Muawiyah by the Umayyads to come toward Medina to kill Imam al Hussein. He is a man who was born, a man who was raised, with his entire intention is to hate Imam al Hussein. That's it. And in fact, the hatred for Ahlul Bayt والسلام, was so much where, that this, where this man lived, and he narrates that there was a man in Syria, and in Damascus, people used to not name their children Ali or Hassan or Hussein or Ja'far or Abdullah or any of these type of names. Names of the Ahlul Bayt. He said that when I left Damascus, there was a man calling his children O Hassan and O Hussein. So I went to this man and I said, what type of a human being are you to call your children Hassan and Hussein? He says, oh no, you're not understanding. He said, I named my kids Hassan and Hussein because they're really big troublemakers. And I always get angry at them. So whenever I say their names, I remember to curse the children of Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is the type of people that these individuals were. This man, let's listen to this. This man, he goes toward Abi Abdullah. He leaves Syria to go toward Medina. His entire task is what? To shed the blood of Abu Abdullah. He stops. Why? Because Imam al Hussein said, take a deep breath. You need a glass of water? Take some water. You need food? Take food. This man says, I, after I spent a few days with Imam al-Hussein, I remember this, I left on my journey with this type of hatred for the house of Ali ibn Abi Talib. When I left the house of Imam al-Hussein to go back to my family in Damascus, there was no one who loved Hussein more than I. Why? Because after a few moments that he spent with Imam al-Hussein, <coughs> we go ahead. On the path toward Kufa, Imam al-Hussein meets Zuhair ibn al-Qayn. We all know. One of the commanders of the army of Imam al-Hussein on the day of Ashura, Zuhair ibn Qayyim. Who is Zuhair ibn Qayyim? Zuhair ibn Qayyim is an Uthmani. He is the one who supported Uthman ibn Affan against and opposed Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is Zuhair ibn Qayyim. He sits and we know what happens. Imam al-Hussein calls him, tells him to come into the tent. No one knows, no one knows what happened in that gathering between him and Zuhair ibn Qayyim. All we know is, Zuhair went into the tent of Aba Abdullah. Not wanting to see his face, when he came out, he said, let me go in the way of Aba Abdullah. What was it? Perhaps just a few words in terms of the etiquette, in terms of the akhlaq of Imam al-Hussein. Imam al-Hussein's caravan continues closer and closer toward Kufa, and eventually, of course, diverted to Karbala. And who does he meet? He meets Hurb bin Yazid al -Riyah. Hur, he takes the water, Imam al Hussein, begins to give it to the horses, begins to give it to the begins to give it to the to, to all of the people who wish to shed the blood of Aba Abdullah. There was one man who narrates. He says, I was lost from amongst the companions of Hur. I was lost my way, and finally I had found my way. I knew the direction which they were going. From a distance I saw Hur and I saw Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu was salam. And as I was on my horse, I was coming, I had gotten lost, I had run out of water, I was extremely tired, I was hungry, I was thirsty. I fell off my horse at that moment. And what did I see? I saw Abba Abdullah with the jug of water running toward me. So he can, and, and what did he do? He poured that water in his own hands and gave it to me. And who was I? I was one of those who wanted to shed the blood of him. But this is the etiquette. And this is the akhlaq of Ahlul Bayt alayhim wa salatu wa salam. Salli ala Muhammad. Allah. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum.
And this akhlaq of Ahlul Bayt, no matter how wonderful, how great their akhlaq was, slowly, slowly, they were always continuously oppressed. But the thing that always caused them to remain firm on the path was that of being patient. Which is why it is said, one day, imagine the scene. The Prophet is in the house of Fatima. He's in the house of Lady Fatima. There is Amir al-Mu'mineen. There is Imam al-Hassan, Imam al-Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. Ahl al-Bayt, Ahl al-Kisa, they're all present in this. It is said that they're having a nice time. They are laughing, they are smiling. When all of a sudden, Jibra'il comes toward the Prophet. He says, Ya Rasulullah. He says, what do you think? How do you feel at this moment? He said, I feel wonderful. I am with my family. I am with the Ahl al-Bayt. I am with my beloveds. Jibra'il said, do you want me to tell you what is going to happen to your family? He says, yes, tell me. It is said, Fatima al-Zahra narrates that my father got up and he left the room and walked into another room with the angel Jibra'il. They began to talk for a few moments when all of a sudden Jibra'il left and we saw my father in sujood and he is crying in a way that I've never seen him cry before. So I asked Ali ibn Abi Talib, imagine the scene, Lady Fatima asks Amir al-Mu'mineen, one of us have to go and see what is wrong with Rasulullah. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, why don't you go? And she says, no, you go. Imam Ali alayhi salam goes toward Rasulullah and says, oh Rasulullah, what is the matter? What is the problem? Why is it that you cry now? Before you were so happy, you were so joyful. He gets up, he gathers his family around him, and he begins to tell them, Oh my family, oh Ahle Bayt Rasulullah. Oh Ahle Bayt, oh my family, oh my beloved. Do you want me to tell you what is going to happen? They say, Yes, oh Father. Yes, oh Rasulullah. And then he says that, But you have to do one thing. That is whatever is going to happen after me, you must remain patient. They said, Yes, oh Rasulullah. We will remain patient. So Rasulullah said, that after I die, first will come you, O Fatima. They will find you between the door and the wall and strike you. They will kill your infant son. They will slap you in the face, O Fatima. But remain patient. O Ali, O Ali, they will strike you on your skull and fracture your head, O Amir al and they will dye your beard in your own blood. But you must remain patient. Imagine the scene at this moment. It's not only Muhammad and Ali and Fatima and Hassan and Hussein, but also there are two women there, two small girls. There was Zainab and Umm Kulthum at this moment. They are there. Rasulullah says, Oh, Hassan, let me tell you what's going to happen to you. They are going to feed you a poison and you are going to begin to vomit your own liver into a pail, into a bucket. But O oh, Hassan, remain patient. And then the Rasulullah began to cry and cry and cry. They said, Oh Rasulullah, what is going to happen to Aba Abdullah? <laughs> Rasulullah says, Oh Aba Abdullah, O oh, Hussein, and the thing that is going to happen to you is you are going to have to take your family toward the land of trials and tribulations. And in that land, O oh Aba Abdullah, you are going to have to witness the martyrdom of your six-month-old infant. His neck is going to be severed while he is in your hands, O oh Aba Abdullah. And then there will be a vile man who is going to come and sever your head from your body, O oh Aba Abdullah. But remain patient. But remain patient. And if you go ahead and you see all amongst all of the traditions of Ahl al-Bayt, all of the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt they have an extreme attachment to that house of Fatima al-Zahra, that same house back in Medina. Which is why all of the Ahl al-Bayt you would see that all of them, they would always think back to those moments, they would think back to what happened to their grandfathers 
Even Imam al when he is in Mashhad, one of his companions come toward him and they say, Ya Rasulullah, why is it that you're upset today? He said, I miss Medina. I miss that land of Medina. And listen to this narration. It is said that when Aba Abdullah al Hussein, he is leaving Medina to go toward Karbala, he goes toward the grave of Rasulullah. It is said that when he was walking toward the grave of Rasulullah, he is walking strong, proud that I am the son of Rasulullah. He sends his salutation on Rasulullah. And then after that, he performs the two rak'ah salat by the grave of Rasulullah. And then he crosses toward Baqi. But when he was walking toward Rasulullah, he walks strong and he's walking proud and noticing that he is the son of Rasulullah. But when he was going to the grave of his mother Fatima Zahra, it is said that he was walking with his head down in a humble way and saying, Oh Fatima, oh my mother, how much am I going to miss you? Then he went to the grave of Abba Muhammad Imam al Hassan and imagined the scene how Zainab had to go and see her grandfather Rasulullah. Imagine how Zainab had to go and witness the, her final visitation toward her mother Fatima. Which is why it is said that when they are on their way back to Medina, when they were on those horses coming back, they saw the walls of Medina and it was Zainab, she fell down from the horse. They said, oh Zainab, why do you fall down from the horse? This whole entire journey you've been strong. And she says, I see Medina now, my home. As they approach closer, a call is made. Ya la O people of Yathrib, O people of Medina, this is the household of Rasulullah. What happened? The, ha the head of Hussein is on a spear back in Karbala and, and, and his body is back in Karbala. At this moment, one man by the name of Bashir bin Hatram, he goes toward Imam Zainul Abideen. Imam Zainul Abideen says, O poet, go ahead and tell them. Tell the people, recite the musibah of my father, Aba Abdullah. He goes and tells them and narrates what happened to Imam al Hussein. When all of a sudden there is one woman, she comes back from the distance. She is dressed in black. She comes forth. She is holding a young child. She, say, she, she says, Oh man, what did you say about Hussein? And the man says, Oh woman, who are you? She says, I asked you what happened to Hussein. She said, But oh woman, tell me who you are so I can tell you what happened to Hussein. She said, I I am the mother of Hussein, I am Ummul Benin. And all of a sudden the man says, Adam Allah condolences to you, Ummul Benin, on the death of your son Ja'far. He was a valiant warrior. And all of a sudden Ummul Benin says, Oh man, I did not ask you about my son Ja'far. Tell me about Hussein. The man says, Oh Ummul Benin, condolences to you on the death of your son Uthman. She said, I don't care about Uthman. Tell me what happened to Hussein. She the man says, said condolences to you, Umm al benin of the death of your son, Abdullah. She said, I didn't ask you about Abdullah. Tell me what happened to Hussein. Then the man says, let me tell you what happened to Al-Abbas. His arms were severed. Then another man, Hurmala bin Kyle, took an arrow and pierced it through his right eye. Then another man came and took an iron rod and hit it on his head. And he fell down calling, Ya Assalamu Alaikum, Ya Abba Abdullah. Umm al benin said, I didn't ask you about Abdullah. But if you told me Abbas is dead, then I know that I, now I know that Hussein could not live anymore. It is said that Umm al Benin, she walks toward the house of Zainab, she knocks the door, the servant opens the door. The servant says, Oh lady, Zainab is crying. She says that no one else can enter except those who wish to partake in the aza of her brother Abba Abdullah. Umm al Benin says, Tell her that I am her friend, tell her that I am her companion, Umm al -Benin walks through the door and she sees a woman who is extremely old looking. She sees a woman who has the marks and bruises of her body from the whips of Shimon bin Bil Joshan. And Umm al -Benin says, oh lady, I am looking for Zainab. Zainab says, oh Umm al -Benin, condolences to you on the death of Al-Abbas. And Umm al -Benin says, oh Zainab, what happened to you? Condolences to you on the death of your brother Abba Abdul. <laughs> we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salatu wassalam 
And for the sake of his mother Fatima, Bhaqa Fatima, wa Abiha, wa Ba'daha, wa Baniha, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for one thing, and that is to get the ziyarah of Imam al Hussein in this life and his shafa'ah in the next life. Allahumma rzuqna ziyarat al Hussein fi dunya wa shafa'at al Hussein fi al Akhara, Bhaqa Fatima, wa Abiha, wa Ba'daha, wa Baniha, wa Sir al Mustawi, wa Fiha. Ya Allah, wa rahmatika, ya Arham al Rahimin. وصلى الله على محمد وعلى اله